Welcome back. Today we're actually going to focus on the research that I did for my dissertation when we talk about immigration from Cuba to New York City. The next four episodes, they're going to be focused on the Antilles, right? We're going to be talking about Puerto Rico, Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, and how those populations ended up to play a significant role in New York City's history. All of them were occupied by European powers, with all except Haiti being occupied by Spain. All of them imported African slaves to work in agriculture, specifically in coffee and sugar. As we will see, the racial character of the societies in each of these places became a sort of justification for U.S. imperialism in the 20th century. So as we'll talk about in a few weeks, after the Haitian Revolution kind of expunged the French Empire and Haiti was able to kick out Napoleon's forces in 1804, Cuba becomes the center of the sugar world. With Cuba replacing Haiti as the leading exporter of sugar in the world, New Yorkers saw an opportunity to profit. New York sugar factories quickly started buying Cuban sugar to be refined in New York in the early 19th century. With this trade, relationships began developing between wealthy Cubans, who were the owners of these sugar plantations, and New Yorkers. Wealthy Cubans began sending their kids to school in New York City. They began depositing their money in New York banks and buying commodities from New York City that made Cuba one of the most technologically advanced places in the world. We have to remember at this time, Cuba is still a part of Spain and would be for many decades to come. By the middle of the 19th century, it wasn't just wealthy Cubans, plantation owners, who were going to New York City. Cuban cigar makers formed a community in the city rolling tobacco, generally imported from Cuba. Due to this exchange between New York City and the United States more generally, and the Cubans, there was longing on both sides for the United States to make Cuba a part of its territory. Many wealthy Cubans sought to be annexed by the United States in the 19th century and become a U.S. state. U.S. presidents like John Quincy Adams and Thomas Jefferson shared this dream. Thomas Jefferson wrote, I have ever looked upon Cuba as the most interesting addition which could ever be made to our system of states. He continued, the U.S. ought at the first possible opportunity to take Cuba. While visions for dominating the island changed over time, it remained a priority for U.S. policymakers into the modern era to exert significant influence in Cuba. But most Cubans ended up wanting independence and not to become a part of the United States. And they declared this in 1868 with an uprising. Cuban plantation owners freed their slaves, many of whom would join the revolutionary forces. Afro-Cubans made up a bulk of the armies of independence that would be waging war on and off against the Spanish Empire between 1868 and 1898. Following the start of the wars of independence, many Cubans found themselves forced into exile, fearing for their life in Spanish-controlled Cuba because they supported the revolutionary cause. An exile community formed in many places in the United States. However, the center of the revolutionary exile community formed in New York City. In 1870, there were 3,000 Cubans living in New York City. They were mostly concentrated in Madison Square Park, which was a neighborhood comprised mostly of wealthy Cubans, as well as wealthy Anglo-Americans. Whereas poor Cubans moved to places like Soho, Tribeca, and the West Village. This community of Cubans would comprise the largest community of any Latino group in New York City in the 19th century. By far the most prominent member of this community in New York City was José Martí. Arriving in 1880, José Martí would live off and on in New York City until 1895, spending the majority of his adult life in the city itself. He would become known as the father of Cuban independence and ran the Cuban Revolutionary Committee from the city. The Cuban Revolutionary Committee went around the United States and Latin America raising money for the cause of independence. Despite finding financial and moral support in the United States and applauding some of the ideas in the U.S. Constitution, Martí remained wary of the United States as a neighbor to Cuba. He had grown uncomfortable with the racist and capitalist system guiding the United States when in the 1880s and 90s, 
the United States began talking about freeing or liberating Cuba, Martí got worried. More than anything, he feared U.S. designs on Cuba, warning against Cuba's clever neighbor, the United States, which wants to bleed us dry on our very doorstep in order to grab with its hostile hands, its selfish and disrespectful hands, what fertile land is left of ours. When the final war of Cuban independence broke out in 1895, Martí quickly went down to Cuba to lead the cause. He was killed in the first battle. His death is memorialized in Central Park in a statue facing south on 59th Street. After Martí's death, the United States and business leaders who sought to profit in Cuba began making the cause for the United States to intervene against Spain in defense of the Cubans. The idea was we would come in and rescue the Cubans who were being treated terribly by their Spanish overlords. During this period, in media depictions, particularly in political cartoons, Cuba is often displayed as a woman, often a white woman, who needs rescuing from a benevolent Uncle Sam. Protecting women, protecting white women particularly, has historically been used to justify violence in the United States, whether it's the lynching of African Americans in the U.S. South or the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. After the intervention of the United States, after the war with Spain was over, after the territories of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines were ceded by Spain to the U.S., Cuba becomes depicted not as a white woman, but instead as a child, and often a black child, which sent a powerful message to a turn-of-the-century United States that was extraordinarily racist. These cartoons were writing a narrative in the minds of U.S. observers who opened their newspapers and saw them. Their popular depiction made U.S. citizens view the people of Puerto Rico, of Cuba, as undisciplined, uncivilized children, that cannot self-govern. Had they not been depicted as children, but instead as full-grown, capable men and women, there would be no need for uplift, modernizing, or civilizing by the United States, which served as the justification for continued U.S. rule in these places. Incorporating the logic of the white man's burden, the United States was able to justify lifting up and civilizing people of color throughout the Caribbean basin. In reality, the dominance of the United States made a ton of money for very wealthy businessmen, and the peoples of the Caribbean became subservient. Yet the logic of the white man's burden allowed the United States to frame itself as the good guys. Many historians today think that Cuba was on the verge of beating Spain by itself, and the United States sort of swooped in so that it could control what the peace with Spain looked like. And what that peace did look like was the United States occupying the island for a number of years before inserting the infamous Platt Amendment into the Cuban Constitution. Now, the Platt Amendment, which the United States forced the Cubans to insert into their constitution to get independence, stated that the United States could interfere in the internal affairs of Cuba whenever it saw it as necessary. The United States did this by sending troops to Cuba three separate times in the first two decades of the 20th century. But normally the United States did not need to insert its troops into Cuba to exert its influence. It did so in subtler ways. Between the United States and, to a lesser extent, Great Britain, foreign investors gained control of the telecommunication system, the railroad system in Cuba, the banking system in Cuba, and most of the sugar industry, which was the main export of Cuba. With such a dominant influence over the Cuban economy, Cuban politicians weren't really willing to go against what the United States wanted. Now, the United States set up domains throughout the island that were almost completely U.S. controlled, especially in the sugar regions of Cuba. Large U.S. run plantations were started by companies like Hershey, companies like the United Fruit and Sugar Company, companies like the Cuban American Sugar Company, which not only owned a large plot of land, but was in charge of every aspect of society on their plantations. As Enrique Leve, whose father worked as a peddler in Macareño, Cuba, where Enrique grew up, remembers, 
the U.S. sugar mill kind of was responsible for all of the employment in the town, like that, they were, right? So all of the services, were they also responsible for them, or was the government involved at all? Government was not involved at all. For example, the electric plant belonged to the, to the, to the sugar mill company. The water supply belonged to the sugar mill company. The streets, if not that they maintained them, but the, whatever the, they had to do, it was the sugar mill company. All the homes, ownership was the sugar mill company, which was given to employees. It was like a company town. The store was the company, the, the, the houses were painted the same way, everything. That's the way it was in Macarena. Was that, I mean, it feels like these existed many places, like Preston seems to have oh, been yes, massive. Oh, yes, yes. Preston was part of the United Fruit, I right, think. Right, right. But like Delicia and Jabada also. I mean, it were, yeah. and, and these were all kind of of the same mode where the it's same company. Mode. U.S. executives in Cuba exploited the networks of formal and informal empire to transport and employ workers from Haiti, as well as those from Spanish and English-speaking Caribbean islands. Mostly U.S. corporations brought Afro-Caribbean workers to Cuba to advance their corporate and geopolitical ambitions with deeply racialized consequences. Afro-Caribbean migrants faced reprisals from the Cuban government in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, where tens of thousands of them were deported back to their respective homelands due to the perception that they were competing with Cuban workers and lowering Cuban wages. With their economy under foreign control, many Cubans took the opportunity to go to the United States to find a better life for themselves. As the Western Hemisphere was exempt from the 1924 Johnston Reed Act, Cubans and other members of the Caribbean region immigrated to the United States seeking low-wage employment in the same way that Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans and Asians had done previously. While many of these Cubans wound up in Florida, we have to remember Miami wasn't even really a city yet, and so a central hub for these Cuban immigrants was New York City. Back on the island, many Cubans began to realize that to be able to accommodate U.S. employers was a way to get ahead in Cuban society. With the aim of changing the way Cubans think and making them in some ways more pliable to U.S. exploitation, the United States government set up public schools while U.S. missionaries and U.S. educators set up private schools in Cuba to educate Cubans in American ways and customs and most especially the English language. This familiarity with U.S. ways and the U.S. language often made them better employees for U.S. businesses in Cuba. Families would often send their children to these schools looking to set them up for success in an economy dominated by the United States. Guillermo Martinez explains he wanted to join his cousins at Belin, the exceptional Jesuit school attended by wealthy Cubans, including Fidel Castro. But his father instead saw English as the path to success in Cuba. In an interview I conducted with Martinez, he recalls, To my knowledge, there were at least two main and three or four bilingual schools in Havana. Ruston was the pro most prominent of them. My, I had an uncle, my father's brother, who was a Jesuit priest. He was one of the most prominent Jesuit priests in Cuba. And I was five, and all my cousins, who were six, five, and four, were going to Belém. And I had a fit, because I was being sent to Ruston. Yeah. And my father told me, I am going to give you a gift that someday you'll give me, you'll thank me for. And the gift was, I am absolutely fluent in both English and Spanish. Martinez's family was not the only Cuban family in pursuit of a U.S. education. In the middle of the 20th century, more than any other country in Latin America proportionally, Cuban students attended Jewish universities. While many Cubans were upset by U.S. economic dominance, wealthy Cubans particularly saw the United States as an example in good governance. They too hoped for a democracy. When Fluencio Batista overthrew that democracy in 1952, many professional Cubans were outraged. Batista was dependent on the United States to keep him in power, as he had lost most of the Cuban population's support because of the way he took power and the way he ruled. Because he was so beholden to the United States, he gave many concessions to U.S. interests. 
the anti-Batista coalition united a lot of groups within Cuban society in the cause of kind of overthrowing this dictator. Cubans wanted a democracy. They wanted to have what the United States had in this way. Um, poor Cubans lived in poverty and were beholden to U.S. interests in ways that really limited their social mobility. And because of this, they wanted to see change. They wanted Batista gone. Eventually, the Cuban army gave up on Batista as well. They were tired of being told to kill and torture civilians suspected of rebel activity. This cross-class unity created the opportunity for Fidel Castro to come to power. And when he did, for many Cubans, there was a reckoning. The first group to flee were Batistianos, or people who had worked directly for the Batista government. Hundreds of them were put on trial and shot by firing squad by the revolutionary government, headed by Fidel Castro. Responding to these trials, around 250,000 Batistianos left, mostly heading to the United States. But Castro's rhetoric against the United States increased as the United States sought to undermine the Castro government, first through economic sabotage, then arming Cuban exiles to go back to the island, and that was the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. They worked with the U.S. Mafia to try to assassinate Castro in the early 1960s. All of these things combined to make Castro very angry at the United States, uh, which he already was because he saw the United States as kind of coming into Cuba and taking it over in a way that really limited Cuban sovereignty. His responses to nationalize foreign companies and eventually wealthy Cuban companies as well set a lot of Cubans off. And many wealthy Cubans in the first years of the revolution left for the United States because they were scared of the changes they saw happening in Cuba, where Castro was valuing economic equality over what they saw as economic freedom. Many Cuban parents were so terrified of the changes going on in Cuba that over 14,000 children were sent unaccompanied to the United States between the ages of 6 and 18. Think about being so scared about what was going on in your country that you send your child to a different one without you. This new community of Cubans that was coming from revolutionary Cuba was already gaining allies against the Castro government. After failing to overthrow the Cuban government with military force, the United States government turned to an embargo, which has been in place against Cuba since the 1960s. It prohibits U.S. trade with the island, as every single U.S. president thought that they could strangle the Cuban economy enough that the people would rise up and overthrow Fidel Castro. With the embargo in place, a wave of Cuban professionals and other Cubans looking to get off the islands between 1965 and 1973, about 300,000 Cubans came to the U.S. After 1966, they were benefiting from the Cuban Adjustment Act that, unlike every other country in the world, allows any Cuban immigrant to become a permanent resident after one year. It exempts Cubans from the immigration quota. It's interesting to think about why some refugees are accepted while others are not. Jews during the Holocaust were largely turned away. And U.S. wars in the Middle East has led to millions of refugees that the United States has declared itself not responsible for. In Cuba, however, there's a government that the United States sees as its enemy. And because of that, in our narrative of framing Cuba as the worst, we state that everybody who wants to leave this place that is the worst can come here. That's what the Cuban Adjustment Act allowed. However, there was still the problem of being able to leave Cuba. That changed in 1980, however, with the Mariel Boatlift where 125,000 Cubans came to the United States to live permanently. Fidel Castro used the opportunity to empty the prisons in Cuba, sending prisoners with those seeking refuge in the United States. While the earlier class of Cubans was mostly these wealthier Cubans, mostly these professional Cubans, well, Cubans that benefited from the Batista government, this newer group of Cubans was often more racially diverse far less familiarity with the Anglo-American customs, similar to the relation between the Eastern European Jews and the German and Sephardic Jews who came before. This later class of Cubans was thought of as more criminal and actually inspired the movie Scarface. Racial and class dynamics are playing out amongst Cubans within the United States in the immigrant community. The last major group of Cubans to come from Cuba was during the Special Period, when Cuba was suffering enormously because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
the United States kept the embargo in place and in fact made it permanent law, making it harder for future presidents to end the embargo. And Bill Clinton enacted his wet foot, dry foot policy, which meant that if a Cuban came onto dry land in the United States, they could stay. For a long time, New York City and New Jersey were the center of the Cuban community in the United States. Union City, for instance, being called Havana on the Hudson due to the large population of Cubans there. Over time, especially after 1960, this has shifted to South Florida. The New York, New Jersey, Philly area is home to the second largest population of Cuban immigrants in the country behind South Florida. This obviously doesn't count the offspring of those immigrants who were born as American citizens. Because a large percentage of the initial Cuban immigrant population after the revolution was wealthier, whiter Cubans, the Cuban community in the United States, and especially the one in South Florida, is perhaps the most conservative among all Latino groups in the United States. This story, and the story of the Cuban immigrants, will continue to play out as we talk about other Caribbean immigrant communities to New York City. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs>